Um, I want to start by thanking the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center and Oxford University Press who published Schizophrenia Bulletin um, and who provide access to the introductory article that we use for the webinar. But they also provide the, uh, the outline for many of these talks um, because we use their theme section. So I want to thank them especially. Um, I also want to thank uh, Nico Stankulescu and Michelle Solis who put a lot of work into organizing this and especially uh, thank you, Michelle, because uh, she did a lot of work and then won't be able to be here for it. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in introductions uh, because we have a lot of speakers. Um, there, it's possible that one or more of our speakers may not be able to make it, but um, they're, they're going to try their best. We're going to start with Joe Coyle of Harvard, who's going to give us a brief historical introduction and um, get us started. Joe? Okay, thank you, Hicken. That's, um it's a pleasure to be uh, to be invited to participate in this uh, webinar. Joe, can I Joe, can I interrupt you for one second? Um, sure. This is uh, the, just to say that um, for those of us who are panelists, um, when we're not actively speaking, um, we should mute our speakers if we can, or just be very quiet so that uh, the uh, the entire audience across the world can't hear the our dogs barking and our, um, our file cabinets opening, closing, and and us talking to people who come interrupt us in our offices. <laughs> All right, but I don't turn my mute off. No, no, you're, <laughs> you're on right now. Everybody else is off. All right. So uh, uh, anyway, I, I've been asked to, um, uh, to make some uh, initial comments to, um, uh, to frame this discussion on the NMDA receptor and schizophrenia and to um, review briefly some historical aspects and finally to discuss some uh, recent results that uh, from our laboratory that speak to the hypothesis. Uh, let me just uh, do my financial uh, disclosure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, schizophrenia is a disorder that uh, affects uh, multiple uh, domains, uh, symptom domains, and uh, it's been uh, uh, broken up into three major domains. The positive symptoms, which include delusions, hallucinations, thought disorder. Uh, negative symptoms, asociality, apathy, poverty of thought, anhedonia, and then the cognitive deficit, uh, deficit in memory, executive functions, uh, problem solving. It's the uh, uh, positive symptoms that uh, are responsive to the antipsychotics that uh, we've had for over 50 years to treat our patients. Uh, unfortunately, um, the more enduring negative symptoms and cognitive deficits uh, uh, contribute um, to the persistent disability because they're largely unresponsive to antipsychotic drugs. Uh, now, uh, over the years, um, I think uh, compelling evidence has uh, developed on highly reproducible uh, patholo cortical pathology in schizophrenia. Uh, there's atrophy of the frontal cortex, temporal cortex, hippocampus, and thalamus, about 3 to 5 percent reduction, though it's not as severe as Alzheimer's disease. There's a reduction in n acetyl aspartate, uh, an amino acid that reflects the, uh, um, the, the integrity or health uh, of neurons in the, these very areas that undergo atrophy. Um, this cortical atrophy correlates with the cognitive impairments and negative symptoms, but not with positive symptoms, which <clears throat> um, speaks to those symptoms unresponsive to antipsychotics. And finally, why is this taking place? Um, it, uh, does not appear to be due to um, neuronal loss or commensurate neuronal loss, but rather to neuronal atrophy, uh, skimpy dendrites, reduced spines, and uh, this is associated with reduced connectivity. And as shown in this uh, figure from an article by David Lewis on the upper, oops, my slides go. Uh, the upper panel shows uh, normal uh, pyramidal. So uh, dendrites and spines, and the lower shows those from schizophrenia, where you can see these skimpy uh, spines. The uh, second uh, neuropathologic change, first uh, described by uh, uh, Spokes and Ed Bird over 35 years ago, is a is a uh, downregulation of uh, cortical GABAergic uh, inner neurons, and specifically, uh, as shown by Francine Bennis and David Lewis, the um, GABAergic inner neurons that express PARV albumin located in the intermediate layers of the cortex and are the fast-firing GABAergic inner neurons that regulate pyramidal neuronal 
activity are the ones uh, uh, most affected. Now, <clears throat> we're focusing on the NMDA receptor, which is part of the glutamatergic synapse, which is uh, somewhat more complicated than the typical synapse, a menage a trois that includes the presynaptic terminal, postsynaptic uh, spine, and the enveloping astrocyte end foot. There are three families of receptors, the EMP receptor mediating the EPSC, the NMDA receptor mediating neuronal plasticity, and the metabotropic glutamate receptors, which are a family of eight that uh, modulate glutamatergic neurotransmission and, and mediate this through uh, uh, G protein uh, coupling. Um, the astrocyte regulates the availability of the co-transmitter at the NMDA receptor glycine, as well as um, uh, deserine, the other co-transmitter. Now, <clears throat> the NMDA receptor is a, a coincidence detector, uh, and, but plays a central role in uh, neuronal plasticity um, uh, throughout development and life. Um, <clears throat> It is uh, normally sil silent unless the neuron is depolarized, which relieves a magnesium block in the channel. Uh, glutamate is the uh, transmitter, um, but it cannot uh, open the channel unless uh, a co-transmitter, um, either deserine or glycine, uh, binds to a second recognition site. And with that, the channel opens, and there is depolarization and flux of sodium. Uh, but more importantly, influx of calcium, which uh, drives gene expression, especially genes involved in uh, synaptic plasticity. And finally, um, the dissociative anesthetics such as uh, ketamine serve as non-competitive um, uh, <coughs> channel blockers of the NMDA receptor. Uh, it is uh, clear now that D-serine is the uh, NMDA receptor co-transmitter in the cortical limbic regions of the brain, uh, where uh, the, its degradative enzyme, D amino acid oxidase, is expressed at a relatively low level, and glycine is the co-transmitter predominantly in the uh, uh, brain stem cerebellum, uh, where there's very high levels of D amino acid oxidase and low D serine. Now, <clears throat> uh, I think the uh, it's it's fair to say say historically that the NMDA receptor hypothesis was put on our intellectual map by this uh, um, highly cited paper by Dan Javitt and Steve Zukin, who connected the dots between Lodge's study demonstrating dissociative anesthetic block NMDA receptors and the uh, clinical observations for over 30 years that dissociative anesthetics can produce a, a syndrome uh, resembling schizophrenia, and what they pointed out was the concentrations of, uh, of PCP that result in psychosis are those associated with blockade of NMDA receptors. Uh, briefly, we uh, became engaged in, in this uh, hypothesis of the role of the NMDA receptors from postmortem studies uh, in schizophrenia, indicating in cortical limbic regions that there were uh, neurochemical alterations consistent with hypofunction of certain uh, glutamatergic neuronal systems. But it's in the uh, 21st century that uh, uh, genetics came to the fore and uh, uh, has spoken to this hypothesis. Uh, schizophrenia has high degree of heritability. It's complex genetics with multiple risk genes of modest effects interacting with environment to produce the phenotype. Uh, more recently, it's become evident that uh, up to 20, up to 10 percent of cases may be due to de novo uh, mutations due to copy number variants, and uh, these risk genes appear to transcend disorder and cut across bipolar, autism, and epilepsy. Now, uh, uh, a SCIS gene uh, has provided a constantly updated meta-analytic compilation of potential risk genes, uh, ranking their relative strength, and uh, uh, the most recent time I've looked at it, it's 127, uh, 1,727 studies over 1,000 listed genes, 870 polymorphisms. But according to their ranking, uh, uh, D amino acid oxidase modulator is the 12th risk. Uh, Dysbindin, a presynaptic glutamatergic uh, uh, expressed gene, is 20th. 
neregulin, uh, 26, uh, KNA receptor, uh, 33, uh, the NR2B receptor, 39, the amino acid oxidase itself, uh, 40, and serine racemase, 45. Interestingly, three of these uh, genes alter the availability of the serine. So, <clears throat> in addition, with regard to the uh, CNVs, a recent publication by uh, uh, Mike Owens uh, found that in an analysis of uh, uh, 18,000 subjects, of which there are 8,000 cases, um, KCNVs are enriched for members of the NMDA receptor complex highly significantly. Our data indicate that defects in the NMDA receptor postsynaptic signaling, which are known to be important in synaptic plasticity and cognition, play a significant role in the pathogenesis of, uh, of schizophrenia. So uh, <clears throat> let me just briefly summarize uh, these risk genes, because individual risk genes are not causative. They would be in, cause endophenotypes, as we uh, call them, that is a fractal of the disorder. But with so many of them, it's quite possible that you could see an interaction in a pathway that would be uh, much more disruptive than any individual gene. So um, uh, I mentioned D amino acid oxidase, um, uh, uh, serine racemate itself, uh, uh, G72, which modulates D amino acid oxidase, all of which would reduce the availability of D serine at the receptor. The uh, NMDA NR2B uh, gene, neregulin, which among other things directly interacts with the uh, NMDA receptor, and uh, and finally uh, MGLUR3, which uh, excuse me, dysbindin, uh, which regulates glutamate release, and finally MGLUR3, which more recently has gained uh, interest because of its role in regulating glutamate release. Now in our studies, um, since uh, D-serine was so prominently um, implicated, and since the, um, uh, the gene um, D amino acid oxidase modulator is not expressed in <laughs> rats and mice, uh, we um, created mice in which we knocked out serine racemase uh, uh, and uh, reducing it, uh, the D serine levels to, to uh, less than 15 percent. And uh, what I want to show you is that <clears throat> in these mice, we see a pathology of the dendrites very similar to schizophrenia uh, with uh, reduced dendritic uh, length and complexity as well as reduced uh, spine density. And when you uh, multiply reduced length by uh, reduced spine density, uh, you come up with a, a reduction in connectivity in the order of about 40 percent. We see similarly a reduction in cortical volume comparable to what's seen in schizophrenia. Um, Looking at these similarities uh, with the serine race maze knockout mice, you see cortical atrophy in both, reduced dendritic complexity, reduced spines, reduced BDNF levels, um, uh, a reduced level of a, a microRNA-132 in both, and we also see uh, uh, subtle, there's subtle cognitive impairments in, in both. Now, <clears throat> the other pathology is the um, uh, downregulation of these um, uh, parvel albumin positive uh, GABAergic inner neurons. And uh, uh, Margarita Barron's uh, pioneered study showing that uh, uh, subchronic treatment with um, um, ketamine uh, results in a downregulation of GAD67. And in this study with, um, uh, <clears throat> with John Listman, they showed the reduction in the postsynaptic. Uh, uh, inhibitory postsynaptic um, uh, uh, currents, uh, consistent with a disinhibition of the pyramidal uh, cell neuron uh, output. So let me just summarize um, uh, <clears throat> these findings and put it in the context that uh, uh, Peter Mogadon really, uh, really pioneered, and that is, uh, this is not a debate about a receptor, dopamine receptor, NMDA receptor. It is a discussion of the implications of pathologic circuitry in the uh, uh, disorder. So uh, <clears throat> first of all, there's a variety of ways you can get an MDA receptor hypofunction, pharmacologically with ketamine um, in terms of risk genes, reduced availability of D-serine, impairments in NMDA receptor function, 
presynaptic impairments, including turgid release with this bindin. Um, Patterson has shown that in the inflammation models of, of, uh, of schizophrenia, you have reduced NMDA receptor function. And finally, is, is the syndrome, uh, autoimmune syndrome, in which uh, uh, antibodies to NMDA receptor uh, uh, autoantibodies uh, produce a schizophrenia-like syndrome. And of course, uh, this hypofunction results in dendritic dysplasia, uh, as well as uh, disinhibition of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as reduced activity of the GABAergic neurons, resulting in uh, disinhibition uh, of the cortical pyramidal neurons. And uh, finally, this disinhibition drives subcortical dopamine release and uh, psychosis. So with that, um, I uh, thank you for your attention, and we can move on to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, in my excitement to get started, I forgot to give everyone a quick tour of the software. And um, that's important because as you're listening to the uh, talks, you may have questions. And um, so, Nico, could you put up the slide that you used to uh, demonstrate? Uh, is that possible? Um, if not, um, we'll, uh, what, what I'll do is to direct you to the GoToWebinar control panel that you've seen. Now, oh, there it is. Um, the, the main thing is to show you that there's a place to a enter questions at the bottom of the panel. And you can be entering those as we go, and then when we're finished with the different talks, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, read as many of those questions as we can. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Nico. So we'll go on to the next speaker, uh, Bita Mogadam from the University of Pittsburgh. Yep. <clears throat> Your slide is on, Bita. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you for uh, giving uh, a chance for me to participate in this. Uh, so I am going to only concentrate really on some of the animal studies that uh, Joe started to mention in the context of the NMDA model and how it uh, has uh, helped us try and understand potential usefulness of the NMDA antagonist model of schizophrenia, um, and also help us really come up with theories in terms of, of testing uh, uh, different uh, treatment options. So uh, I'm going to start with this slide. All of you know about this, but I'm going to actually, uh, you'll, you'll see a little bit, in a little bit why I'm starting with this. Glutamine hypothesis schizophrenia was really simple when it started. It essentially just stated, as Joe mentioned, that glutamine neurotransmission is hyperfunctional. And then it kind of graduated to NMDA receptor being fun uh, hyperfunctional. And the primary evidence for it has been and, and remains that the NMDA receptor antagonists are psychotomimetic. Uh, well, uh, this was a big deal in the beginning for many of us because it was far more elaborate than the dopamine hypothesis. Uh, because it really provided a fundamental uh, shifting in our thinking of which mi micro and macro circuits are um, involved not only in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia, but could be useful for drug development. Uh, and Dan will mention this, hopefully, but in, in, uh, it was also conceptually really important because glutamat in glutamatergic models of deficit, we are looking at uh, a number of distributed cortical and subcortical regions that include both uh, sensory and, and higher cortical uh, uh, regions. So an important thing about this hypothesis was that, of course, the glutamate synapse is uh, what the military uh, calls a target-rich synapse. And uh, this is kind of elaborating on what, what Joe had mentioned in that there are a whole host of uh, targets. And this is an old slide showing a limited number of proteins that could influence the function of the synapse. You have the uh, uh, postsynaptic side that is primarily thought to be GABAergic, uh, at least in the cortex. Uh, and so you have a number of proteins, including MGLU5, um, and it's different subtypes, different uh, uh, sites on the NMDA receptor, uh, as well as a number, a whole host of other targets that are connected to the NMDA receptor to postsynaptic density, including ERP4 and neurogelin. Uh, then you have the sites on, on glial, uh, glycine transporter being one that, that Dan will talk about, as well as presynaptic sites 
uh, that includes MBLU23 receptor, which is not in, exclusively on the presynaptic side, but it could influence the glutamate release. And also, you have other uh, uh, other uh, proteins on the presynaptic side that have been implicated in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia, including glutaminates that uh, converts glutamine to glutamate. Okay. Uh, so what we have learned now in the last few years is that this 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 simple story is not that simple. Is that glutamate neurotransmission really is not hyperfunctional? Uh, an MDA receptor function. Uh, there is no direct evidence in postmortem or genetic studies that NMDA receptor per se is is uh, dysfunctional. In that there's nothing that doesn't appear to be anything wrong with the protein of the NMDA receptor. Uh, that's not to say that uh, the actual synapse is not is, is not disrupted. But the fact remains that NMDA antagonists are psychodomatic, so potentially could this be that these drugs are simply producing a transient disruption of networks? that are disrupted in schizophrenia. So uh, the focus of a lot of basic research has been in trying to understand this, this, you know, the nature of this disruption. Uh, and so let me just tell you a little bit about all the, one old study and one newer study that were uh, in terms of uh, helping us think about not only physiology but drug development. So the first surprise was that, that uh, this is not about glutamate neurotransmission being hyperfunctional. And that has led to what I would call a disinhibition hypothesis that involves the GABA interneuron. And the gist of that started several years ago when we started recording cortex or uh, measuring glutamate in the cortex and giving animals an MD antagonist. And while we ex expected a reduction in activity, because after all, MD receptors are excitatory, so if you block them, you should see inhibition. What we saw is that no matter what an MD antagonist we, get, we, got, we gave animals, we always saw an excitation. Uh, so just two examples. If one is measuring glutamate in the prefrontal cortex. You, you see an enhancement of glutamate release uh, with an MD antagonist. And this is, I should say, that this is entirely consistent with human MRS studies that typically show increased glutamine and glutamate levels uh, after ketamine. We also see postsynaptic activation. This is a recording from awake animals, giving them MK801 in this case. Uh, this is 87, 85 cells from seven animals, given vehicle or MK801. Uh, and as the uh, colors get warmer, the units are firing faster. And as you can see, the general effect in about 30 or 40 percent of cells is an excitatory response. And this is consistent with fMRI studies, showing that ketamine enhances prefrontal cortex activity, or what I would call noise level. So mechanistically, what's going on? Uh, well, if you go back uh, to, uh, in, in, uh, to this figure, what we thought was that, okay, glutamate release is being enhanced. So uh, we didn't know why it's, at the time, why it's being enhanced. So if you actually block it through MBLU2-3 receptor, maybe you can block the effects of an MD antagonist. And you could see, you see nice blockade of both behavioral and neurochemical effects in animals. Uh, with the agonist, and most of you know that uh, uh, a prototype of it, this, this drug went into clinical trials. It's been initially the news was sort of good uh, because uh, the, in, in the initial paper, after four weeks of treatment, there was a comparable reduction in pants negatives and positives uh, in, as, as compared to olanzapine. Uh, there have been several other trials that have been uh, mixed in that there was either a, a mistrial or the most recent, I think, is the story that it's effective, but then the effective, the, uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness kind of wanes off, which is, was the initial huge caveat with the whole uh, approach in that uh, the drug is a direct agonist, and any pharmacologist will tell you that it's a bad idea to go uh, with uh, chronic treatment of any anything with a direct agonist, because essentially uh, you are facing desensitization. Now, whether this is why there's an issue with this target or not, we don't know. But nevertheless, as a basic researcher, the main question for us was, uh, what's the mechanism? Uh, why does this drug reduce the effects of an MD antagonist in animals? And why does it potentially, briefly at least, uh, um, help the symptoms of schizophrenia? In, in humans. 
So mechanistically, we have sort of graduated to what I would come, uh, some, uh, consider or explain as this inhibition hypothesis. And essentially, what uh, that explains is that uh, in the antagonist, based on this hypothesis, and I'll briefly mention it, uh, uh, and it was, I think, explained in the chapter that, uh, or the review that uh, Darren and I had recently in neuropsychopharmacology, as well as the, the uh, bulletin chapter. Uh, essentially, the hypothesis explains why in the antagonist increased cortical activity. It could also account for the GABA data that, that Joe mentioned and GAS67 deficiency being potentially associated with schizophrenia. And it could also explain why FIRISH2 agonists are hallucinogenic. Uh, very briefly, uh, this, the way this mechanism or this hypothesis works is that if you have a pyramidal cell in the prefrontal cortex, which is why I'm, this cartoon is depicting, uh, the, they, are, they are inhibited very uh, strongly by GABA interneurons, and that works through GABA A receptors. So if there is reduced activity of GAT67, we potentially reduce GABA release here, then you could have a disinhibition, uh, I'm sorry, a in, uh, reduced inhibitory effect of GABA of uh, pyramidal cell, and therefore you see pyramidal cell activity. Now, the same could happen with an MD antagonist in that both GABA interneurons and pyramidal cells are driven by excitatory afferents uh, through NMDA receptors. But the trick is that there, is, there are more open channels on the NMDA and the GABA, and Joe mentioned this, on the GABA interneurons than uh, pyramidal cells. So blocking them with NMDA antagonists actually leads to disinhibition, thus activation of pyramidal cells. And the work of George Agageni and Gerard Merrick had also shown that published T2A receptors could also drive these uh, pyramidal cell activation. So the idea is that through many mechanisms, you could actually enhance the activity of these pyramidal cells, potentially increase cortical noise, and disrupt cortical uh, network activity. Uh, this is the simple hypothesis we've had. Unfortunately, at least the stuff that we have been trying, we have been getting, is not really coming out the way we had predicted. Uh, the nice thing about this model was that it has very predictable functional endophenotypes in that there's reduced gamma interneuron activity, increased pyramidal cell activity, and reduced gamma oscillation. Um, the only part of this hypothesis that was shown in awake animals was this portion that I showed you. So recently, we've been trying to essentially test this type, uh, these other mechanisms in, in a way freely moving animals. And what we find is that, in fact, 5 h 2 hallucinogens do not mimic the effect of NMDA receptor blockade. Reducing GAD activity does not mimic the effect of NMDA receptor blockade. Also, reversing the constituent activity of GABA receptors enhances and not uh, inhibits GABA oscillation. Uh, and these two have been published. This is, uh, this is uh, about to be submitted. And I don't know how I'm doing for time. I can just briefly mention this potentially starts some, uh, for, uh, to help with the discussion. Uh, sure. Go, if you talk fast, I, I think you'll have time. I will. Okay. <laughs> so let me just, 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 tell, just show you two slides that show this. Essentially what we did in this was we, we recorded cortical activity, both local cell potentials and unit activity in awake, freely moving rats, and, and gave them either an MD antagonist, uh, to, to a hallucinogen, and also amphetamine at very high doses. Uh, and we predicted that all of these should produce relatively similar effects on cortical oscillations and cortical activity if this simple NMDA, uh, if the, this inhibition hypothesis is at, uh, remotely accurate. And what we see is this. So what I'm showing in the left side is unit activity. This is with uh, DOI, MK81, and amphetamine. And here is the LSP power. And as you can see, they're all doing completely different things. With MK801, I showed you excitations at the unit level before. We see a profound activation of gamma. With 5 h 2 receptor uh, activity, we saw a profound inhibition in awake animals. This is in contrast to slice recordings and, and the reduction at gamma lower, uh, and, and, and theta. And, and, and amphetamine, essentially, we see something very different. So basically, different classes of Psychotic drugs have very different effects on the direction of change in unit activity and gamma power. But the fact remains that uh, this is a, these are psychodomimetic. So what uh, we are looking at right now is that potentially we are actually looking at the functional endophenotypes here that 
the way we've been looking at at least the, the disinhibition process and the role of GABA interneurons and their regulation of an MDA receptors, that's not what we should be looking at. And we should be looking at more systems related uh, uh, measures. So I'm going to stop now and I can come back to potential ideas of what, what uh, endophenotypes we should be looking at. Thanks, Peter. And we may have some time uh, when we get to uh, questions okay. as well uh, for sure. co and comments. Um, and, and you can now put your phone on mute if possible. And okay. um, our next speaker will be Dan Javitt. And we have to give him a, a special thanks both for organizing the theme in Schizophrenia Bulletin and also for being the, the lead organizer for this webinar. I will make one other note. Um, as you, and I noticed there's already a, a new question in the, in the queue. If you if you'd put in the name of the person that you're specifically addressing with your question, that would be great, unless it's a question generally to the panel, in which case we'll pose it in that way. So, uh, Dan, are you there? I'm here. Um, great. Do you see my screen? We yep. do. Okay, good. Then we're all set. And um, so I'd like to thank Hakan for organizing uh, the webinar and um, getting it set up, and Joe and Bita for the great introduction to date uh, so far. And I just want to take off on two uh, specific predictions of the glutamate uh, model, which um, again, Joe gave a background of, of how we got to this, and we've been working on it for 25 years at this point. Um, so I want to talk about conceptual implications of it and also treatment implications. Uh, on the conceptual side, I think one of the main differences that we have to keep in mind between the glutamate and the dopamine models, uh, from dopamine, we've tended to thought of schizophrenia as involving just very specific brain regions areas like frontal cortex, uh, which are definitely involved in schizophrenia, but are not necessarily the t totality of schizophrenia. Uh, and this is just a in situ hybridization map of where NMDR receptors are in the brain, uh, making the point that they're everywhere in the brain. Um, they're certainly in frontal cortex uh, and in striatum, which is a dopamine-rich area, and, and they probably regulate dopamine there. And one of the reasons dopamine is impaired in schizophrenia is likely to be the local NMDA dysfunction, uh, but they're also elsewhere in the brain, in the hippocampus and in sensory cortex. So when you think of schizophrenia from a glutamate perspective, you think of the entire brain. Uh, and I just want to show how that uh, plays out in terms of the experience of schizophrenia. Uh, and then in terms of treatment implications, uh, as Joe said, uh, NMDA, or Nabita said, uh, NMDA receptors are target rich. Uh, we've only begun to exploit um, the targets. I'll talk some about the glycine deserine site approaches, uh, but there's also a glutathione story that's emerging. And I think one of our discussions, uh, Honda and uh, Gundas Bruce will be talking about that later as well. In terms of the um, conceptual side of schizophrenia, um, okay, how do I advance this? Just click on the slide. <clears throat> click on the slide, oh there it is, sorry, okay. That was in my practice session. Um, in terms of the conceptual side, so again, we tend to think of schizophrenia as involving frontal cortex, but uh, NMDA receptors are as much in um, sensory areas as they are in frontal areas. So one, if one believes this glutamate story, uh, there should be impairments as well, even just in very simple sensory function. And that gets important, uh, picking up on Vita's point about endophenotypes in terms of where you look for function. Uh, so one thing that I want to, one process I want to point out is mismatch negativity, uh, which is an evoked potential that's generated in auditory cortex whenever you have a series of tones that's interrupted by an infrequent tone, beep, 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 boop, and it happens automatically whether or not you're paying attention. And this is something that NMDA receptors are known to be involved with at the level of auditory cortex. This is auditory sensory memory. It happens pre-attentively uh, whether you want want it or not, and it's one of the ways the brain keeps you informed of what's happening in the environment. Uh, this is something that if you thought of schizophrenia from a dopamine perspective, you would not necessarily think would be abnormal, uh, but in fact, this process is as impaired in schizophrenia as any other cognitive process. Uh, so whether you vary the pitch or the duration of a stimulus you can see in controls, there's a very large response from auditory cortex um, just to the difference in pitch, and that's serves to try to capture your attention, and in schizophrenia that process is reduced, and these are the kind of models we need because we can also show uh, that if you give ketamine to normal healthy volunteers, you can reproduce that exact same deficit, 
Uh, and we can also use this translationally in, in animal models and monkeys and rodents to look at underlying um, circuits. Uh, when we talk about the impaired outcome in schizophrenia, again, we tend to focus on very high order processes. Uh, but if you just think of the simplest things that break down schizophrenia, for example, most patients with schizophrenia tend not to complete their education. Uh, very few achieve uh, college education and a lot finish education even before uh, end of high school, uh, grade 12. And that's because their educational, um, their ability to benefit from education tends to decline about two to three years even before onset of illness. Uh, one thing we've been looking at what processes predict uh, why they can't complete education. And it turns out uh, that even the breakdown in these very simple sensory measures, mismatch negativity, uh, is the best predictor of their inability to have achieved education uh, with patients with the worst mismatch negativities, um, for the most part not even completing high school. Uh, these are processes that tend to break down early in the illness. Um, in fact, when people do um, prodrome studies, these are among the best predictors of progression to psychosis. So in terms of what we should be targeting if we want to prevent the onset of the illness, rather than treat it once it happens, uh, these sensory level deficits are exactly what we should be targeting. Uh, and again, it, it goes back to breakdown of NMDA at the level of cortex. Uh, the same thing seemed to happen in the visual system. Uh, the visual system is complex where you actually have two separate systems. Uh, one that you're consciously aware of is perception for action, for, for identification, which is in the ventral stream. Uh, but there's also a dorsal stream uh, visual system uh, that lets you orient your attention in the correct place and it's really the dorsal stream that seems to involve NMDA receptor function uh, to the most extent. Uh, you, can br you can differentiate the two systems uh, because they tend to be somewhat different in terms of their sensitivity to contrast and if you look at just response to very low contrast which involves that dorsal stream, uh, here you're just doing a very simple evoke potential flickering back and forth uh, between these two stimuli, no task, nothing really to uh, to do except look at how well, how much activity is generated within the early visual system. Uh, and here you can see that even um, in something as simple as that, there's a lot less activity generated within the early visual system. And if you use a CAT model, uh, you can show that you can produce the exact same deficit using an NMD antagonist. Uh, so sensory areas of the brain are as impaired as any other area uh, and breakdown in those regions produces a lot of um, the deficits that we think of in schizophrenia and also let us start studying things that we don't usually think of. Uh, one of which for example is reading. Uh, we don't tend to think of patients with schizophrenia as having difficulty reading um, but this magnocellular visual system is exactly the system that's involved in reading uh, in developmental dyslexia, it prevents learning how to read. Uh, in schizophrenia, these systems break down later around, um, you know, adolescence, um, late teenage years. Um, so if, if, again, if these glutamate theories are correct, uh, we should be seeing breakdown in reading. It turns out that almost all the reading studies that have been done have been done with single word reading, uh, which remains intact once you learn it. But if you look at paragraph reading, uh, in fact, patients do extremely poorly on paragraph reading. Um, they do as poorly on this or more poorly than anything else that you might be testing. Uh, and if you look at the brain regions that break down that are responsible for this, uh, here we coded low spatial frequency regions of the brain in, in red. Uh, and if you look at the areas that don't activate during reading that are supposed to activate, it's these low spatial frequency areas that receive the magnocellular input uh, which in turn is dependent on NMDA function. Um, so you have group differences in these very simple processes that lead to higher, higher order impairments, things like reading. Um, so when we think about uh, what is abnormal in schizophrenia based on these NMDA models, it's not just uh, attention executive processing, the usual, uh, but even things like face recognition, uh, reading, um, and um, uh, sensory detection paradigms uh, and when we think about what we need to fix in order to improve cognition in schizophrenia, uh, 
uh, what these say is that we should be studying these biomarkers as in the phenotypes, uh, but our remediation approaches uh, should probably target these very basic sensory systems. So that's on the conceptual level. I think one of the things that hasn't um, gotten as much attention from, from the glutamate theory as maybe it should, although it's coming out now. Um, on the treatment level, um, there are NMDA receptors are embedded in circuits, and there are a lot of circuit ways to try to influence NMDA function, uh, but there are also a lot of just direct ways at the NMDA receptor itself. Uh, one is, and Joe alluded to some of this, just targeting the glycine site of the NMDA receptor complex. This is an allosteric modulatory site. Uh, there are several compounds that have been tested, glycine and deserine are among them. Um, and these are all small studies, um, they're, they're natural compounds, uh, you have to use high doses in order to get them in the brain, uh, but against those limitations, in fact, when you look across the studies that have used them, you tend to get consistent results, uh, 10 to 15 percent improvement uh, across these studies. Uh, there's been some variability of significance of effect, and that's mostly because in some studies placebo has done uh, better than um, you'd expect. Uh, and so the drug is always producing the same effect. Significance is determined on whether or not you, ha you use a good placebo. Um, but these at least have been encouraging, and we're encouraging to the point uh, that encourage drug companies to get involved in what we call the next generation approach. And here, instead of trying to give high doses of glycine and deserine and get it into the brain, in a sense turning up the faucet, uh, we can also block the transporters that take glycine out of the synapse and out of the brain something called the glycine transport, glycine type 1 transporter, and this is very analogous to depression where you want to raise serotonin levels. You don't do it by giving high doses of serotonin. Uh, you do it by blocking serotonin reuptake. So this is very analogous, but here we block glycine transport. Uh, in animal models, uh, this has been shown to be very effective. It, it works in many of the models that have been associated with schizophrenia. Uh, and a compound uh, that does exactly this has made it into phase two and now phase three studies. Uh, this is a compound RG1678, also call, called bitapertine, uh, which is being developed by Roche. These are slides that were presented at the ECMP meeting in 2011. And here they did a very straightforward eight-week treatment study uh, using multiple doses of compound uh, versus placebo and looking at negative symptoms uh, as their primary outcome measure, persistent negative symptoms. And of course, one of the main differences between PCP models and amphetamine models is PCP produces both positive and negative symptoms, whereas amphetamine is mostly positive. Uh, so you'd expect there to be persistent negative symptoms if all you're doing is blocking dopamine systems. Uh, in fact, they got um, encouraging results uh, where two of the doses that they used, the, the middle doses, and we can talk about why it's the middle doses later, uh, in fact, separated from placebo, so they got significant improvement in negative symptoms, and also in terms of things like response rate and CGI of negative symptoms, uh, they also got uh, encouraging results. Uh, based on these, they're now in phase three. Their phase three studies are part way through, uh, so till those studies crash and burn, uh, we can actually have hope uh, that there is a new treatment uh, based on the glutamate model that may make it to clinic uh, within the next several years. Uh, they're not the only company that's developing for this. There are several companies uh, that have compounds also in phase one, phase two, uh, that could become available um, if this approach works within the next several years. Um, the last concept I want to uh, bring out is that um, so far we tend to treat um, using drugs, but a whole new approach uh, for treating brain diseases has been uh, brain stimulation. Um, and especially something called transcranial direct current stimulation. Uh, what this is, is it produces a small current uh, just across the scalp, uh, but it's enough to uh, depolarize neurons uh, subthreshold. NMDA receptors are voltage dependent, uh, so if you depolarize the neurons that they're on, it increases current flow when they do open. Um, a simple device, it's battery operated, nine volt battery, you, you put one to two milliamps of current across target regions, and it does seem to, it doesn't seem like it should work, does seem to enhance local NMDA function. Uh, it's been studied a lot for depression, uh, but a very exciting study 
uh, was recently published in American Journal of Psychiatry where they stimulated over auditory cortex using direct current stimulation uh, and in fact got significant and even persistent uh, improvement in hallucinations just from a one-week uh, intervention using this brain stimulation. So it could be that pharmacology will be good in targeting NMDA receptors and lead to new treatments, uh, but brain stimulation may be another approach. Um, there's also the redox site, uh, and again, we may hear more about that later. That could be a target. Uh, glycine transport inhibitors are, are now in phase three, could be new treatments. Brain stimulation approaches could be new treatments. And here, uh, we're targeting persistent negative symptoms uh, for the most part, uh, but also just to remind people that even things like positive symptoms are not fully treated with current approaches. Uh, these might be better for positive symptoms as well. And certainly the sensory and cognitive impairments that are the core of schizophrenia are not really treated with our present approaches. And the hope is that glutamate-based treatments will fondly allow us uh, to target some of these core deficits. Uh, and with that, I'll stop. Thanks, Dan. Um, we're going to jump right ahead to Adrian Lotti, who is at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, did I get that right? It's, it should be Larry. <clears throat> oh, it's Larry. I'm sorry. It's Larry uh, Kegelis of Columbia University. Thank you, Hakon, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present. Um, just show you my screen in a second here. Um, Okay, Larry, we can see the slides. Great. So what I'm going to do is take the opportunity to um, update us on um, the latest that we've been finding with MR spectroscopy uh, in, uh, in schizophrenia and uh, also with ketamine administration. So sometimes... Um, You'll hear uh, <coughs> thing that you'll hear about what MR spectroscopy shows in schizophrenia is what Joe Coles summarized, which is that is that there is a deficit of, of NAA in schizophrenia in many brain regions showing functional uh, neuronal deficits. More recently, we've been able to look directly at glutamate itself and glutamatergic compounds, including glutamine, glutamate, and the mixture of uh, glutamate, glutamine, often symbolized by GLX. And one thing you'll frequently hear in summaries of such MRS studies is that they're very mixed. And the point that I want to make is that, yes, it's true that they're very mixed, but if you focus on those that studied only unmedicated patients, there's a very clear and simple story. There are relatively few such studies, and I've summarized them here. Going back all the way to 97, the Barta study, coupled by Teberge, and one that we published last year in the archives, and in every case, those studies that have looked in the medial prefrontal cortex have found elevations of glutamatergic compounds. So the story um, can be fairly simple. What we wanted to do by looking further, let me see, I'm trying to advance that. Just click on the slide. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Is to look in two brain regions in the same subjects. So you see here the medial prefrontal cortex voxel couple of brain views, and also the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex within the same subjects um, looking in unmedicated patients with schizophrenia. And this is what we found. We found that in a, a matched uh, set of controls, a set of medicated patients, 16 of them, and another set of unmedicated patients, we found these findings that in the medial prefrontal cortex, GLX was elevated by about 30%, but no difference between the medicated patients and controls. But in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this is quite a surprise, no differences at all within the same patients. So we did a more careful search of the literature, and we looked back and found that there, in addition to those studies that I cited of the medial prefrontal cortex that had similar findings across the years, in the medial prefrontal cortex, we found in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that there had been two earlier studies, one by Stanley and colleagues, 
back in 96, another one by Orman in 2007, that did look in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And there they found, as we did, no changes in the unmedicated patients. So there seems to be a strong regional dependence of these findings. I don't want to get too far ahead for uh, Adrienne, but she is going to tell us about another interesting brain region. And I will mention one other finding that's come out just last year uh, by a colleague, um, uh, De La Fuente Sandoval, who published in Neuropsychopharmacology just last year, very interesting cohort of unmedicated patients with schizophrenia, actually first episode unmedicated, uh, as well as high-risk subjects. And he looked in striatum, and in the striatum he also found elevations of glutamate. And the last thing I want to show is that when you give ketamine in healthy subjects and follow the time course, that you get uh, an elevation and a subsequent decline, very reminiscent of uh, beta's microdialysis data. These data, uh, let me say something first about the uh, infusion protocol. This is the same infusion protocol that's being used in treatment acutely of depression. Half a milligram per kilo infused at a steady rate over 40 minutes. 40 minute period, starting from zero and running out to 40 minutes here. But this is administered in healthy controls with 15 minute subsequent acquisitions. Each bar is a 15 minute acquisition in the medial prefrontal cortex. These data do not have the same interpretation as microdialysis data. They are not extracellular levels of glutamate. As people probably know um, MR spectroscopy gives you total tissue measures of the metabolites. So this is a sum of all the compartments of GLX in that brain region. It certainly includes the extracellular space, but every other compartment as well. But an interesting conclusion here is that there must be a net increase within that medial prefrontal voxel of glutamate that surges over this time period and then returns to baseline shortly after the end of the infusion. I want to point out that there have been other studies, of course, of ketamine given to healthy controls, and they do all find surges, or, or two at least prior studies find surges. In one case, uh, Laura Rowland was the first study uh, published in 2005, found a surge of glutamine, the same brain region. And just last year, also in the frontal cortex, um, over a much longer period of time, a longer infusion at a later time point, a surge also of glutamate in a paper by Stone and colleagues published just last year. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that colleagues of mine are doing a study like this in depression, acquiring MRS data led by Matthew Milak, and finding, I'll just say qualitatively similar data. We haven't done the quantitative comparison yet to healthy controls. And uh, finally, that I want to acknowledge the um, the, the, the really highly skilled uh, physicist, spectroscopist, Takoma Shungu, who does these studies with us and enables us to acquire these data. And so finally, I want to point out that what these data are showing us now in humans is that there's kind of a, an extension, if you would like, of the face validity of the ketamine administration from symptomatic resemblance to schizophrenia to now neurochemical resemblance. So you see a, a, an increase due to ketamine in the medial prefrontal cortex, acutely induced during the intoxication, similar to the elevated levels of glutamate that occur chronically in schizophrenia, analogous to the, um, to the time course of symptoms, chronically in the patients, acutely induced in the healthy subjects. So why there is such a beautiful correspondence between the acutely induced situation with intoxication and the chronically occurring situation in schizophrenia is, is something we need to answer. But these data highlight that fact. And with that, I'd like to uh, end and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, so the next speaker is Adrian Lotti from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. So first thing I would like to uh, thank the organizer, organizer of this uh, webinar to invite me, and I'm really delighted to uh, show some of our data. So like Larry, we have used uh, MR spectroscopy to look at the level of glutamate 
uh, in patients with schizophrenia. And what we did was to look in the hippocampus. And what you see here is a voxel. The voxel we place uh, in the left hippocampus to uh, obtain those levels. And like Larry, in unmedicated patients, uh, those 27 uh, unmedicated medicated patient, we saw a significant increase in uh, glutamate level, in GLX level, compared to a match group of um, healthy control. Okay. And the, same, the same as Larry, uh, who showed that there were no increase, no differences in uh, glutamate level when we were looking, they were looking at patients who were medicated. We saw the same in the hippocampus in a large group of 48 patients with schizophrenia compared to much healthy control where there were no differences in uh, uh, glutamate level, suggesting that somehow uh, antipsychotic medication uh, alter the level of glutamate level. So going back to the patient who were uh, off medication, so we look at the glutamate level, but we also look at the, uh, the, volume, uh, the, the volume of the hippocampus. And like a lot of people before us, we show that uh, patients with schizophrenia, those unmedicated patients, had a decreased volume. And as you can see uh, in uh, this picture, the, the, the decreased volume was located more in the posterior region of the hippocampus. What, what we did then was to look at the relationship between glutamate and hippocampal volume. And what we saw in, in the patient only, and that was not seen in healthy control, we saw that in some region of the hippocampus, there was a correlation between uh, glutamate level and volume. So in this region that is very similar to the region where we saw there was a, a decreased volume in patients with schizophrenia, um, higher, level, higher level of glutamate was associated with smaller volume. So this might suggest that a glutamatergic alteration may account uh, for the volumetric deficit that had been seen in patients with schizophrenia. So this is one type of glutamatergic abnormality that we saw in patients, but we also saw another type. Um, so this slide shows you the relationship between a neuro a metabolite, between uh, glutamate and N-acetyl aspartate. And it shows you that there's a nice positive correlation between the, ne the neurometabolite in the hippocampus. And this is a pretty replicated finding in healthy control that has been found by several people and it has been found in different regions, including in the anterior cingulate cortex. That those two neurometabolites was correlated is not surprising because they are really linked closely to each other through cycle, the TCA and the glutamate, glutamine cycles. So we wanted to look at uh, what would happen with this uh, relationship in patients with schizophrenia, and this was again in the hippocampus, and we saw that this relationship was not there. There's a really decoupling of those two metabolites, and this was in medicated patients, uh, in a pretty large group of uh, medicated patients. Finally, we also asked the question, what would we see in a patient when they were off medication? So again, we uh, saw a lack of correlation uh, between NA and GLX, the la the, a lack of positive correlation when patients were off medication. And this is actually the same patient when they were off medication and six weeks after being treated with an antipsychotic, and again, like we show Previously, so we have replicated our own data. There was a lack of positive correlation between the two metabolites. <coughs> so this might give us 
some indication of another type of abnormalities and uh, that are related to glutamatergic dysfunction. And this, this uh, alteration was seen not only in medicated but unmedicated patients, so it's more like a, a tray um, uh, signal for the illness. And um, so when it comes to the to um, the glutamate, glutamine cycle, we know that uh, we've, you've seen this slide uh, several times uh, today, that uh, glutamate is packed first in vesicle and then released in the synaptic, synaptic uh, cleft. And then what is not what does not bind to uh, receptor, glutamatergic receptors is going to be transported in astrocyte, where it's going to be converted to glutamine, transported back to the neuron, and converted back to glutamate. What is really important is that there are proteins throughout the cycle that really <coughs> control uh, the, this cycle. And in fact, some of those uh, proteins have been shown to be abnormal. Their expression has been shown to be abnormal in uh, some uh, post-mortem studies uh, of patients with schizophrenia. And uh, a lot of this, this uh, work come from the lab of uh, Jim Mead, Woodruff, and Rob McCollum Schmidt, who are also here at UAB. So this, um, you know, so from those data, we can perhaps make further hypotheses about you know, the origin of this uh, uh, um, glutamatergic abnormality. And in this case, it, it was in the hippocampus. So this will be uh, the end of my presentation. <coughs> Thank you, Adrian. Uh, the last uh, short uh, presentation of data will be from Handan Gundus Bruce of Yale University. Uh, thank you very much, Hakan. Let me just... Uh, I get ready here. Yep. Okay. It's All right. So let me add my thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to join this webinar today. And, uh, I'm, um, I'm sorry. Just one second, if you can remember to switch the view so we can see the the slide in its entirety on the screen. I thought I just did that. I. Hey, no, uh, uh, hold on. One more time. Try again. And so now if you can swap the, the view. <clears throat> so is this not good right now? No? One, one second. Uh, not yet. <clears throat> All right, I'll try one more time. How is this? Uh, <clears throat> still not not the whole uh, screen. Okay, let me give it another try because I've been uh, interestingly swapping. Uh, uh, I don't know what you tried before, but for a second we had it. Oh, it was there okay, for a second. Here we go again. <laughs> Just for a second. No. Mm, no. Uh, why don't we go back to the edit mode and you can show them from the edit mode. <clears throat> uh-huh, here. So, ah. Uh. <laughs> okay. Did it work now? No, uh, just, just, use it. just show them from, from this, uh, from this uh, screen. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, let me do that. All right, so... Um, Sorry, sorry about that trouble, but I, I wanted to briefly discuss our findings on the interactive effects of ketamine and n acetylcysteine today, and I might refer to n acetylcysteine as NAC. Uh, we heard a lot about, um, you know, the fact that in schizophrenia, you know, part of the pathophysiology might involve uh, reduced function of the NMDA receptor, but also increased glutamate transmission. Uh, in the different corridor areas. And this is an effort to, to try to undo this process. So um, NSC-dose 
let me go back to this slide now, is a compound that's been widely used and studied in the context of substance abuse disorders, uh, primarily led by uh, Peter Kleibus's group. And in acetylcysteine over here, um, it basically stimulates the cysteine glutamate exchanger on the glial cells. And this is an exchanger or anaporter. It's not energy dependent. It just works based on the concentration gradient of the, of the glutamate. And with the delivery of cysteine, um, it's taken into the glial cell, and one molecule of glutamate in turn is, is given, given out, and uh, it increases the extra snap in the concentrations of glutamate, at least temporarily and which in turn stimulates the uh, presynaptic and thrombotic receptors, which so you put a break on the system and they uh, decrease, their stimulation decreases the release of glutamate into the synaptic cleft. Um, so using this approach, David Baker and colleagues found that an acetylcysteine pretreatment attenuated the behavioral and cognitive effects of pencyclidine in rodents. Their findings were pretty dramatic, actually. Um, they measured the uh, behavioral and cognitive effects of pencyclidine in rodents, um, including exact measurements of the extrasynaptic glutamate concentration with the use of n acetylcysteine using this approach. And they found that um, and acetylcysteine pretreatment reversed the effects of encyclidine both in uh, behavioral cognitive domains as well as, you know, attenuating the extrasynaptic levels of uh, glutamate concentration. So we were primarily inspired by, by this kind of work and sort of wanted to see if we could replicate this in, in healthy humans. So the overall idea, again, is being by stimulating this um, cysteine glutamate exchanger uh, with n acetylcysteine as a tool, could we reverse the effects of ketamine in healthy humans? Um, so we collected symptom ratings, cognitive measures, spatial working memory by CANTAP, and some attentional measures, also ERPs, including mismatch negativity based on and Javits work earlier, and then Umbert, and also P300. It's also been shown that ketamine attenuates the P300 signal, which is a little bit different than mismatch negativity because it's, um, it directly involves um, uh, devoted attention to the task. Um, let me just, before I go on to the next slide, tell you that we did not actually observe any effects of NAC on ketamine-induced changes on uh, behavioral or cognitive measures. However, we did have some interesting findings uh, with NAC alone on the target and novel stimuli uh, for the P300 measure. Um, if I can just walk you through this slide, I, I'm not sure how people are really you know, if everybody is able to see this in detail, I wish I could give you a fuller picture. I'll try one more time. Is this helpful at all? No, it's um, not showing. Try it one more time. Try it one more time. No. Okay. Uh, how, uh, I, is anybody seeing anything at all? Uh, let's go back to the, the previous one. At least that one was uh, a little bit larger than what we see now. Okay. So um, over here uh, is the P300 data. The um, all right. I'm done. Go go back to the edit mode. We cannot see uh, what you're pointing to. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. All right. So over here, the the red lines uh, tracings represent the placebo condition. Uh, the dark uh, black lines represent the anesthetosystine condition. One can appreciate in the right panel that there is a very significant effect that's visible to your naked eye, uh, even without statistical analysis, uh, that 
and acidosis is, is, is uh, associated with, with a significant increase in P3 peak amplitude here. Um, our main outcome measure was obviously the interactive effects of n acetylcysteine with ketamine. Um, so the green line on the left panel represents the ketamine effect, ketamine condition, I should say, and the <clears throat> blue line represents the n acetylcysteine plus ketamine condition. And then, as you can see, there's there's no difference there. So we got pretty much the same type of um, effects for the novel stimuli. Um, so, in, in summary, you know, unlike in the rodent world, we really could not replicate the um, attenuation effects of ketamine on, uh, I mean, uh, any sort of stain on the ketamine in these changes in the study. But um, interestingly, we found that NSD-dosystane alone did something good, and it was associated with um, increased P300 amplitude to the novel. And and target stimuli in our hands. Uh, it, it, the dissociation may really be to a number of things. Unfortunately, we have limited availability to try different doses um, in, in such heavy duty studies. It may be a dosing effect. Maybe we needed to administer an acidal sustain in a more chronic fashion uh, because there are actually some clinical trials in schizophrenia showing, showing some efficacy. But, but we nonetheless think it merits further work. Um, so as a last slide, maybe I could, if I can take another 30 seconds, I want to tell you a little bit about our unpublished data. So here, um, I'm not able to, unfortunately, disclose all of the information, but uh, hopefully we're going to be able to do that in the upcoming biological psychiatry meeting. But our lab has been working on an, an MBA-dependent peripheral marker. Um, with the target, uh, with the goal of being able to come up with a biological bio, a biomarker based on a blood test to be able to uh, facilitate early detection of schizophrenia in the prodromal phase. So um, this is a central and MDA receptor dependent measure, and um, we have a small N at this point. We're looking for funding and collaboration opportunities, but we're pretty excited that um, at least initially we have uh, quite strong of a signal uh, with uh, strong discrimination of uh, schizophrenic groups that are uh, depicted with the green triangles here, um, separating them, you know, from the rest of the group which are composed of unipolar depression and healthy people. We actually had six healthy individuals clustered over here, but because of the overlay, one is not quite easily able to appreciate that. So um, that's all I wanted to say at this point. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Handan, um, and to all the speakers. Uh, as usual, we're like the children who go shopping uh, when, uh, to the candy store and we're hungry. We buy too many things. We have too many. We, we have lots of speakers. We've gone over time a little bit. Uh, we also have a lot of questions, and uh, I'm going to do the questions backwards. Usually, we would ask the questions that were submitted ahead of time first, uh, but those tend to be a bit more general. I think we'll take longer to get through. What we're going to do is we're going to ask the panelists to answer any questions that we don't uh, get to during the question and answer session uh, in writing. And we'll post that to the Schizophrenia Research Forum uh, within the next few weeks, I hope. The, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to the more recent questions that were posed during the talk. And I'll start with the questions that were addressed to a specific speaker, because that will be something we'll be able to get, a bit more, get through a bit more quickly. Um, the first question was from Amy Easton, and it was for Beta Mogadam, and she wrote, do you think acute NMDA antagonists might model acute psychotic episodes in humans specifically rather than a continual and sustained elevation in glutamate through the life of the disease? This would change how clinical studies are designed if this might be true. Beta, are you there? Oh, Bita, are you there? And do you have your uh, microphone turned on? I think we don't have Bita. So we will go on to a question for Larry Kegelis. Uh, 
Uh, Matthew Hopman. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Peter, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it's a uh, um, I just got disconnected and connected. So, did you want me to answer that question? I already moved. Yes, on yes, that. please, please. Okay. Uh, so that's a that's that's a great question that really does not have a good answer because there's really no good way of of testing that. Uh, the only guidance is the the behavioral effect of acute ketamine on healthy individuals and and how that resembles some of the chronic symptoms. I would say that uh, it does have it has relevance to cognitive deficits of of, of chronic schizophrenia in that acute ketamine does produce some of the uh, cognitive deficits. Uh, so in, in, in that context, I would say it is relevant to some of the symptoms of, of, of chronic schizophrenia. Uh, in terms of acute psychosis, um, uh, you know, acute ketamine really doesn't make a lot of people psychotic. Uh, so I would, in fact, argue that it's more relevant to more sustained cognitive deficits than anything acute. Um, Bob McCarley uh, wrote a, a question that said, please note chronic effects of ketamine different from acute effects. Have you looked at these? It sounds like a related, if not the same question. Uh, I wonder if he means animals or humans. Uh, humans, actually Larry can, can uh, uh, respond to this, but I think their group had a couple of really nice studies with pretty clean chronic ketamine users. Uh, that showed some subtle cognitive deficits, uh, but in terms of chronic with animal studies, there are some differences. Uh, but I, you know, as uh, I, I, I'm not sure what the differences between um, the actual symptoms. There's some differences with dopamine in that you have, you know, dopamine activation versus lower dopamine in, in acute versus chronic. But in terms of, again, going back to some of the cognitive deficits, they're very much the same. An acute dose of PCP or ketamine very, produces very similar cognitive impairments as uh, repeated PCP or ketamine. Larry, do you want to address the, the human aspect? Um, sure. Uh, so we did, our, our group did run a PET study. Um, it was actually a dopamine study, so we don't have a glutamate outcome measure um, for it. But yes, it was um, recreational ketamine users, and what we found was uh, using a uh, dopamine D1 uh, frontal cortical radio ligand, that th the binding of that ligand, the binding potential for that ligand was elevated in the, in the chronic ketamine users, uh, exactly analogous to what we saw in schizophrenia. So there was that resemblance. Uh, however, the cognitive deficits were extremely mild, barely detectable, really not significant, and unlike the patients. So it's possible that it was um, early early use, highly functioning, um, young ketamine recreational users who later might have progressed um, cognitively to a, to a, a deterioration, but uh, that's what the study showed. Larry, right, and they, Hockin, the only thing I would add is we did a monkey study where we did chronic PCP treatment, and one of the things you don't get from acute PCP or ketamine is hallucinations. Uh, but if you treat chronically or subchronically in monkeys for a couple of weeks, you start getting what looks like uh, response to auditory hallucinations. Um, so that could be one thing that needs um, more persistent NMDA dysfunction uh, to come out. Thanks. Larry, we'll stay with you for another question, um, which is from Matthew Hopman. And, uh, medial prefrontal cortex is a key element of the default mode network. Are you aware of any studies examining correlations between MRS measures of uh, GLN and default mode network functional connectivity, which might be elevated in schizophrenia? Uh, Matthew, that's a great question. We are just embarking on a study like that. I don't know of any uh, data like that, but we have we're gathering fMRI data and MRS data in uh, the same subjects now and uh, hope to answer a question just like that. So thank you. Another question for uh, Bita and, and Larry both comes from uh, Tobias Bast. Um, what may explain that in spite of evidence for prefrontal disinhibition, there's no convincing evidence to his knowledge for prefrontal hyperactivity in patients at rest? whereas hippocampal hyperactivity at rest has emerged as a very consistent finding. 
Uh, so I can answer that. So this is not hyperactivity, and I really uh, wish as a field we'll drop the hyper-hypo concept. Uh, this, what this does, at least in the animal model, is it essentially locks some cells into a state, and they're firing a little faster, and it, it, it's really increasing background noise. That's what it's doing. It's locking some cells into state, so now they cannot respond. Uh, to task relevant events. So it essentially makes your cortex less efficient to deal with uh, a task at hand. And it's by potentially increasing background noise. So it's really, it's not about hyper or hypo. It is making the cortex less efficient uh, and locking some cells into a state of potentially hyper or hypo. And if you see, if you look at my data with the DOI, you can also argue that DOI is long, it, it, or hallucinogen serotonin and hereticogens are locking the cells into a kind of a lower activity uh, state. But by locking them, and if you don't allow them to, you, don't make, you make them unavailable to respond to task at hand. So it's about making the cortex less efficient. Joshua Hurtado asked, would glutamate hypo hyperfunctionality be as central as overall deviation from an equi equilibrium analogous to the dopaminergic equilibrium inverted U. That Should wasn't addressed to any particular okay. person, so maybe uh, uh, Dan or, or, or you'd like to assign it to someone. Um, and yeah, beat is on her all. She can she Okay, can I can, going. yeah, I can. Uh, so everything in life has an inverted U shape. <laughs> every pharma, every receptor, every, it's not something that's unique to dopamine. It has been eloquently discussed. Uh, by, by Pat Goldman and, and Amy Arnston in the context of dopamine, but it is something that applies to almost every biological phenomenon and every receptor system. Uh, but in the context of uh, hyper-hypo, again, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's that you have a little bit too much, not enough. Uh, I, I think it's more but the glutamate synapse is very much a synapse that needs to be timed correctly, and so it may be more of a this regulation than a simple hyper hypo. Right. And I think we can't get beyond there there's a tendency to broaden the focus beyond NMDA receptors, but we know that compounds that block other types of glutamate receptors are not psychodromatic. I mean not only do they seem not to help schizophrenia, but they also uh, if you block them they don't cause psychosis. So I mean, our point of entry to this is that if you block NMDA receptors then it doesn't matter what site you do it at, you produce psychosis. Um, and the question is, you know, why the NMDA is breaking down, but, and it affects the entire glutamate pathway, um, but it's important not to just break it out into hypo or hyper, as, as Vita was saying. This is a question from Philip Thibault to the whole panel. Why do we see more consistent glutamate decrease in chronic schizophrenia in various regions of interest via MRS and inconsistent results? in parentheses, increased, decreased, or no change in first episode psychosis studies, is there an assumption that very early in course of illness, glutamate is high, which then decreases over time? Uh, this is Larry Keglis. I could, I could uh, take a guess at that, which is that from the um, review of the literature that I've done, I think really the more useful breakdown uh, of the studies of, of glutamate is along the dimension of medicated, unmedicated. And I think that there is increasing evidence that medications do second generation antipsychotics, probably first generation as well, lower glutamate. And they lower it to normal levels and possibly uh, with chronic use even below normal levels. And I, that may be what is, is seen. I think if you break out just the studies of unmedicated patients, um, regardless of stage. So for example, in my study, uh, they were not all first episode. Half of them were first episode, but the other half were, um, um, you know, um, middle middle course, uh, 40 years old, late 30s, and still showed elevated glutamate. So I, I really think it's an issue of whether medications are on board or not. I'm going to finish. Concur oh, with uh, Larry's comment because this is also what I've seen from our data. Is really made medication is making much impact on level. Um, we're getting very close to the end. I'm going to finish with one question for Dan Javitt, um, which comes from Hugo Geertz. He asks, 
what is a possible reason for loss of clinical effect at the highest dose of the GLI-T1 inhibitor? Does one see the same inverse U-shaped dose response with D-serine or D-cycloserine or glycine? Uh, right, and that's, that's again an excellent question, and it gets into those inverted U-shaped curves that Vita was talking about and, you know, Pat golden Mary Kitchen has been talking about forever, um, and it constrains what we can do. Uh, but it seems to be that if you overstimulate the NMDA receptors, you then get um, desensitization, downregulation, uh, actually migration of the NMDA receptor away from the uh, synapse. Um, so the sweet spot seems to be about 50% occupancy of the GLIT1 receptor uh, with these targets. Uh, and if you go beyond that, um, you start losing efficacy. Um, the same thing probably holds true with glycine and deserine, but we're limited by the doses we can give, so we probably never made it uh, to the other side of the dose response curve. Uh, with decycloserine, there's some, ten some suggestion uh, that maybe that is what people were seeing and that even um, once a week decycloserine may be more effective than once a day um, because it prevents desensitization. Um, so it means that even though this is a great site for us to target, um, we have to be gentle uh, and that it may be we need to come at the same synapses in more than one way in order to fully restore function. Uh, I'm actually going to give the last word not to Dan, but uh, to Vita's best because he added a, a quick comment a, a further to Vita's recent answer. If prefrontal neurons are quote unquote locked into an active state, even though this may be dysfunctional, one may still expect increased metabolic activity, which should show up in imaging studies. Um, I don't know if there are any responses to that. If not, then I'm going to say that uh, we're going to close the questions and we're going to thank the speakers, but we will uh, try to get all of these remaining questions answered and posted to the website. And um, a special thanks to Dan Javitt for um, putting together um, the both the, uh, the journal uh, session uh, section and uh, for working with Michelle Solis to put this together. Thank you.